You can't just fuse the hostie. That's where you're wrong, kiddo. <laughs> oh boy. I have been waiting for Siege to go on sale for a long ass time now, because there was no way in hell I was ever going to pay $80 reduce to play it. And no, I'm not just going to sit here and complain about how much I hate the Canadian economy, Justin Trudeau, declining oil prices, multiculturalism, my nationality as a leaf. No, this video is about a video game, and according to Uplay, I have about 36 hours of PvP time which I think is a relatively reasonable amount to be able to fully judge this game on. And man, do I have a lot of things to talk about regarding Siege. Because even with the glaring issues it has, I still think it's a pretty damn good and fun game to play. So, lass uns anfangen. There really aren't many shooters out there that let me take a slower, more tactical approach to gunplay in this day and age. Most shooters that have been released in the recent years seem to have been designed with a high octane nature in mind and almost encourage you to be constantly moving. But playing Siege and rushing in with reckless abandon will only serve to get you and possibly the rest of your team killed. And you gotta make your life count, cause if you die, you're donezo. You ain't responding until the next round. Health does not regenerate, and it only takes about 3 or 4 bullets from most automatic weapons for you to drop dead. And some rifles and shotguns will just drop you in one shot no matter what. Headshots from any weapon, regardless of what caliber the bullet is, will kill you in a single hit every single time. This makes you and everyone else around you feel very, very fragile. It may sound kind of overbearing to have to critically think while playing a first-person shooter of all things, but by having to do so, Siege sets itself apart from a lot of other shooters on the market. It adds a sense of tension and, dare I say, realism that most games tend to shy away from for the sake of balance, but also ends up feeling a little bit stupid and almost broken sometimes. The best example I can give of this is with characters who wear larger helmets. Every character's head hitbox includes their helmet, so characters like Blitz and Jaeger actually have a larger head hitbox than most other characters in the game. Blitz, maybe I can understand giving a larger head hitbox, because he has a shield. But Jaeger has three speeds, so he doesn't need to have this massive head hitbox. And, well, speaking of characters specifically, this game does have heroes or champions, or whatever you want to call them, but it's a little different from other class-based shooters. In Siege, you have Operators. These guys and gals function somewhat similar to the way that heroes or champions would work in other pseudo-RPG shooter MOBA-style games. But for the sake of making a relatable comparison, I'm going to compare Siege's Operators to Overwatch's heroes. Overwatch has attack, defense, tank, and support heroes. Siege, on the other hand, only has characters for attack and defense of which can only be played on their respective teams. This means that you can only play attack operators when attacking and defense operators when defending. Allow me to give an example of how these team-based operators play off one another. So Thermite, a character on the attacking side, has the ability to destroy reinforced walls. A defending character called Mute has a jammer he can place down in the ground to stop enemies' electronics from working. This renders Thermite's ability useless. Thatcher, on the other hand, is an attacking character who has the ability to destroy enemy electronics via EMP grenades. So he can use these to destroy Mute's jammer, which would then allow Thermite to use his ability to breach reinforced walls. There are a ton of other counters like this in the game, but this example is probably the most common occurrence you will run into while playing. Now, since Siege has these team-specific operators, the game doesn't function on the concept of the Holy Trinity, that being DPS, tanks, and healers. Sure, you have characters like Montaigne and Doc, who could technically function as tanks or healers, but both of these characters aren't required to be played every match. In a game like Overwatch, your team is required to pick a healer like Mercy and a tank like Reinhardt every single match. Now, I'm not saying that the Holy Trinity is a bad thing to have in video games. All I'm saying is that it is not present in Siege, despite the fact that the game does function on a sort of class-based system. The only thing that actually makes these operators unique is their specific gadget and weapons. Besides that, you can really play every operator almost the exact same way. So if most weapons function the same way, and most characters play relatively the same besides having their unique gadget, what makes this game replayable in any manner? Well, it's all in the maps, their layout, and the insane amount of destruction. Allow me to tackle each one of these things individually. Every time you load into one of Siege's maps, you'll be put on either the attacking or defending team and randomly selected to play one of three game modes. Of these three game modes, the objectives have different locations that will be randomly selected at the start of each round. If you're playing on the attacking side, it's your job to find the objective and then assault it. If you're playing on the defending side, you've got to set up fortifications and hunker down. As of right now, 
Siege has about 14 maps that vary from government buildings, frozen over yachts, awful grimy favelas, and your typical suburban houses. Now, if I were to take a bird's eye view of these maps, you really see how they start to differ from a game like Counter-Strike. Let's take Dust 2 for example. This is an overhead view of the map, and in it, we can see the spawn locations of the attacking and defending team, and we can also see that the defender spawn is very close to their objectives. We also see at least three primary pathways that the attackers can take to reach their objectives, along with some crossways that lead in between those primary pathways. Majority of maps in Counter-Strike games tend to follow this waffle-like philosophy. Siege, on the other hand, is very, very different. At first glance, the pathways and crossways that we see in CSGO just aren't present here. It's almost like the map is just one big box. But in reality, there is a lot more space being utilized than first meets the eye, especially when you look at it in a vertical perspective. Every single map consists of multiple floors, which then consists of a plethora of interconnected hallways and rooms, all of which are built in a realistic, almost maze-like fashion that will require multiple matches to fully comprehend. Learning the layout of these maps is key to playing this game effectively, because even if you have a reaction time of under 50 milliseconds, you won't be able to see someone shooting at the back of your head from an angle you weren't expecting. Now, this next feature I'm about to talk about is probably one of the game's main selling points to a lot of people. And while it's not my personal favorite thing about the game, it is still absolutely awesome. That is, of course, destruction. Um, because she apparently talked And straight up, Siege is the best destruction I've ever played around with in a video game. The only thing that comes close is probably Red Faction Guerrilla, and that game came out almost eight years ago. Almost any wall, window, floor, or ceiling made of wood, drywall, or thin metal can be completely obliterated by whatever means you choose. Not only does it look awesome, but it also serves a practical purpose towards gameplay and isn't just there for the spectacle. The amount of replayability and options the player has at their disposal are increased tenfold because of this insane level of destruction. Can't get past this wooden wall? Bring a sledgehammer to it. Want to pop a hole in a reinforced wall or ceiling? Get Hibana to punch one wherever she pleases. Think an enemy's walking around on the other side of a wall? Just blast a couple holes through it and pray you might hit him. Hell, depending on the caliber of the bullet you're firing, the size of the hole that the bullet makes in the wall actually gets bigger. And that's freaking cool, dude! I have had more than one occasion where I have smashed a hole in a wall and managed to net multiple kills on unsuspecting victims by shooting them through said hole. It feels so good to do because you know the person you just killed is sitting at their computer and saying, You know, I'm, I'm just gonna go uninstall now. Although, my favorite thing about this game would have to be its sound design. It's definitely not perfect, but goddamn, there is something really immersive about sitting in a corner and intently listening for enemy footsteps. When I'm playing with friends, we all just tend to do the exact same thing. Quickly reinforce walls, set up our gadgets, find a good corner to crouch in, and then just listen. Of course, most of the time this will just end up with us slowly getting picked off one by one, but it still feels really cool to mind meld for a few moments. There are very few games that I can think of that put such a heavy emphasis on using sound as a gameplay element, and not just a prop to enhance the visuals through music. Siege takes it to the next step, because from what I found after playing this game enough, is that listening for your enemy is far more important than actually seeing your enemy. Seems like a weird thing to say because you have to be able to see your enemy to shoot them, but in a game like this where preparation is key, G.I. Joe said it best. Knowing is half the battle. Cluster charge deployed. Detonating cluster charge. Cluster charge. If you can hear your enemy running towards you, and you know just from intuition and experience alone where they are going to come from, you can just pretend to close your eyes and pre-fire your weapon before you can even see them. Which, finally, brings me to one of the big negatives I have about this game. I honestly feel like a lot of the times I die in this game are completely unexplainable or just plain bullshit. It almost feels like when these circumstances arise, my enemy manages to see me before I'm able to see them. And it's not just me. A lot of my friends felt this way too. As it turns out, we're not blind or crazy. It just has to do with the game's camera placement. Now, most first-person shooters place the camera around the height of the player model's eyes, which makes sense. In Siege, the camera is placed around the height of any given player model's collarbone. What this results in is situations where the player being killed is believed to be in cover but in actuality, their head or shoulders are completely exposed to the shooter. Why someone at Ubisoft thought this was a good idea to implement in a competitive online shooter is beyond me. Not only that, 
but this game has got to have some of the worst netcode I've ever experienced. I'm fine with having about 70 ping or so when I play on a server in any online game. I usually prefer around 30, but I can deal with 70. Although, at this point, I'd have to say that I'd rather have 300 ping, because Siege has an insane amount of lag compensation that actually benefits players with higher ping over players with lower ping. I don't understand how Ubisoft can create such a well-designed game only to completely fuck it up on the network end. It's like, for every good experience I have playing this game, someone else I'm playing with or myself will just have a bad one. It's brought down to such a mediocre level because of a few simple and easily fixable fuck-ups. And yeah, sure, it's great that they're doing another year of freemium content, but maybe they should consider fixing the core gameplay before trying to coerce people into purchasing yet another season pass.